So I'm here today with Reed Hunt, um, who is uh, best known for being at the, the chairman of the FCC during the Clinton administration in the mid-1990s. It was a very exciting time for uh, development of communications. Um, there was the Telecommunications Act, there was a uh, huge growth of the internet leading up to the, the internet bubble at the end of the 1990s. There was uh, the beginnings of, of auctions of spectrum. It really was a, a, a time of very rapid change. So it's a real pleasure and delight to uh, have Reed Hunt here with us today. Hi, Reed. How are you doing? Good. Good to be with you, Nick, and good to be with your 39,000 students. <laughs> so uh, Reed has uh, been very involved in the last few months of raising the debate and asking many questions about um, you know, the, the, the very controversial topic of data privacy, government tapping, government eavesdropping on citizens, and uh, all of the things related to the Snowden leaks and the NSA. So it's uh, very relevant and uh, uh, very timely to be able to have Reid uh, talk with us today. So Reid, I just wanted to ask you a, a very first, uh, to start with, really a more general question. Um, many of the students that are, that are watching from outside the United States and perhaps don't know what the FCC is, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, and what they do, what their responsibilities are. Can you just give us an overview of what the FCC is responsible for? You bet. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission is what in the United States we call an independent regulatory agency. There are five commissioners. One of them is the chair. I was the chair because Bill Clinton picked me among the commissioners to be a chair in 1993. Uh, it is independent of the executive branch, meaning the president cannot tell the FCC what to do. It gets its powers from the legislature, but once it has those powers, it regulates, and the only check and balance on the regulation comes from the courts, because companies, individuals can challenge the regulations and say that they're illegal or they're unconstitutional and can take the issue to the court. So the Federal Communications Commission as an independent regulatory agency is quite a bit different than the regulatory agencies in many, many other countries uh, for two, respect, and two reasons. Number one, in many other countries, the regulatory agencies do report to the executive branch. And second, in many other countries, many parts of the communications industry are owned by the government in whole or in part, as is the case in China as is the case in Germany, as is in the case of, of France and other countries. So in the US, we don't have government ownership of the information communications and technology sector, with a few very, very minor exceptions. There are some small towns that own their own telephone companies. Uh, and we have a regulatory agency that is independent of the rest of government. By far, the Federal Communications Commission is the most powerful regulatory agency for the information, communications, and technology sector in the United States and relative to all other regulators in the world in this sector, it is by far the most powerful agency. So during the, during the 1990s, during those times of just enormous change, um, you know, in, in every aspect of communication, long distance telephone communications, deregulation of the industry, um, and, uh, and, and, and the growth of the internet, the auctioning of spectrum, the changing of rules uh, on consolidation of radio stations, of ownership of radio stations. They were just massive changes. Um, so what role did the FCC play in that? And, and to what extent did, uh, was, were those changes foreseen and understood? Because they must have meant big changes to the FCC itself, not only to the policy that it was uh, advocating. So uh, I became the FCC chairman 20 years ago next month, uh, November 1993. And approximately that was the month that the internet was invented as a commercial matter, meaning that was approximately when um, Mark Andreessen's uh, Mosaic browser um, was exploding uh, across the United States and then the rest of the world. And when everyone saw that the Internet could be used not just for text and not just for 
fairly uh, academic discourse, but rather you could get to the internet by plugging in your own personal computer to the telephone network, and you could download the browser, and then with this browser you could turn your own PC into a website, and also go to anybody else's website and see pictures or listen to music, then all of a sudden, really in just the matter of weeks, everybody in the United States and pretty soon everybody in the world said, holy cow, uh, this is going to completely transform the world. Uh, so two things were uh, told to me right away by a whole bunch of people in technology. Um, the first was something said to me by Nicholas Negroponte, who then was running MIT Media Labs. He said, you need to understand that everything in communications is backwards. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we use the airwaves for broadcast television. We use the airwaves for video. Video is lots of data. And the airwaves, as a matter of physics, are really not well suited to carry all that data. Mm -hmm. And we use lines, copper, we use an underground physical network to carry voice communication, but that's really where the data ought to be, where you have lots of packets to carry because voice is hardly any, any data. So he said, your job at the FCC is to do what I call the Negroponte switch. You need to have all voice communication go over the air and all data communication go in physical networks that are terrestrial. So that is a big strategic change. And what he meant in the American system is not that the FCC would order that, but that it would change all the regulations so that companies that wanted to execute on this great switch actually could do so. So they could get spectrum for mobile communications, so that they could build physical networks that interconnected with existing networks, so that they could uh, write their content differently, so that they could have access to networks for different kinds of content. And in a very, very big picture way, that's exactly what we tried to do starting in 1993. And I got to tell you, the FCC was hugely successful, and the American tech industry was hugely successful, and the American communications industry was also very successful in executing the biggest transformation uh, at scale of any businesses in history, meaning the entire Bell network went from a fixed-line voice telephony network to an over-the-air mobile communications network. And that represented well more than $100 billion of capital expenditure and a complete transformation of every uh, aspect of the way that they were doing business. So that was, the, that was the big switch. And then I told you there were two things I was told. Here was the other thing I was told. And I was told this by Andy Grove, the CEO of Intel, uh, in the, at the Stanford Park Hotel, about uh, 400 meters from where you're sitting right now, Nick. Uh, in the beginning of 1994, he said, you need to understand that this is a war. And I said, what do you mean it's a war? And he said, data, packet switch data, is the disruptive enemy of circuit switched communication. I'm going to let you make sure that you've taught all your students oh, yeah. exactly what that means. <laughs> We're very familiar with that, yeah. <laughs> he, said, he said, you need to understand that those who depend on analog communication and circuit switch technology are going to be relegated to the dustbin of history and you need to make sure the government doesn't try to save them, that the government makes the way for the winning technology. So, so we really tried to do that and that really, really did happen. And there were many losers uh, as a consequence. I'll conclude by giving you the biggest example of a huge loser. Mm -hmm. uh, by the late 1990s, AT&T was the dominant long-distance company in the United States and the most powerful international company in the communications area waving the American flag as its headquarters. More than $100 billion of market cap, immensely significant in every major city in the world. 
Within less than 10 years, its market cap was one-tenth of that, and it was sold for a song to SBC, which took its name as AT&T. It did not execute on either the switch from circuit to packet right. or the move from landline to voice being mobile or the move to uh, uh, physical networks carrying uh, data uh, as their dominant mode of business. It didn't execute on any of those changes and it was a huge loser. So if you look at some of the big changes that happened during that time, um, w are there some that if you uh, got to go back and, and, and revisit them that you, would, uh, that, that, that you think should have been handled a little differently? Uh, in the United States, uh, no. Um, the information and communications uh, revolution um, meant a commitment as a matter of business and as a matter of government to the notion that there would be winning companies and losing companies. Uh -huh. That was a reversal of the traditional policy which was this. Nobody would win a lot and nobody would ever lose. In other words, stability. Stability. Uh -huh. In other words, you know, one big company, a few companies in broadcast, lots of little radio companies, one major newspaper in every city, tremendous stability, very little innovation, no risk. The communications platform would be like the ground under your feet. It wouldn't ever be subject to the earthquake. It wouldn't ever be at risk. And instead, we moved to a completely different model. Tremendous upheaval, tremendous challenge uh, to, for the companies to change, a willingness to cope with change, and the result was that we had a fantastic economic boom. So there's really nothing about that at the big picture level yep. uh, that I think we should regret. So one of the uh, one of the consequences of the big change to the internet is that uh, that stability that we saw that was holding back some of the circuit switched world now has become a stability holding back the packet switch world. And uh, for example, the industry structure around a an internet architecture, a narrow waste of IP that really has not changed very much over the last 15 or 20 years, and an industry structure that has favored closed, vertically integrated uh, equipment. Um, for which the pace of innovation of the networking equipment itself has been relatively slow, particularly if we compare it to the computer industry as a, as a whole. Um, now, there are changes afoot to sort of break apart some of that vertical, uh, uh, in, sort of vertical integration um, and uh, open up interfaces and uh, bring about a more sort of a software-based uh, rate of innovation in the network infrastructure. Do you think that um, government and, and, and government regulation has a place to, in the, in a sense, the, the give governance and driving of the internet? Well, uh, I would say yes and no. Uh, so I think you're describing, one way to talk about what you're describing is the uh, difference between a, a closed and open, and another way to talk about it is the difference between horizontal and vertical, uh -huh. right? Yep. So, um, what do we mean by horizontal? Well, the famous um, um, writings of Andy Grove in the 1990s about the computer industry all focused on the notion that the industry was horizontally organized. There would be a um, chip industry. Intel would be his primary example, and it was indeed, without question, the most profitable semiconductor business that ever existed, still is the most profitable semiconductor business that has ever existed, but it did not move vertical. It did not do the software that is the operating system, and it didn't do above that the application layer, and it's similarly, if you want to extrapolate to different services that might be provided as versions of delivering on applications, Intel wasn't involved in that. There would be different companies at each of these layers. There would be competition within the layers, but the layers themselves would cooperate in order to deliver the finished product. That's the horizontal, non-vertical model. The great that challenge really, for that, yeah. the great challenge to that is the Apple model, right? <laughs> yeah. Which is, we'll just do everything from the bottom to the top, 
and it won't be open to anybody and we may get vendors to provide things but everything will be done will be done our way if you ask should government dictate a horizontal market structure or a vertical market structure I would say government should really enjoy the battle uh, of the different companies for uh, economic success with different models. There's no obvious reason why government should say one model is better than another model. That's horizontal and vertical. Now let's talk about open and closed. Open and closed has at least two different uh, meanings. Uh, one is the meaning that I think you might apply to standards. So for example, uh, let's take the Microsoft operating system. Was that an open system? Well, not really. Uh, you had to get permission to design an application for it, and even if you got that permission, you would, it would be not open in any way like the Android system. Uh -huh. First of all, it wasn't open because people would have to pay for access to it, and second, it wasn't open because it didn't permit uh, a, a community of innovators to alter it and use it in a particular manner. So should government speak to that kind of open-closed? Again, I think that's a question of business model, and the government ought to keep its nose out of that. But another meaning of open and closed is where those words apply to what an antitrust lawyer like me would call bottleneck or monopoly power. Mm -hmm. So uh, take a look, for example, at... Uh, Google's uh, market share in search. Uh, any government in the world would say that the 80-90% market share that Google has for search represents a monopoly market share. And that search engine is not open, mm -hmm. meaning there's nothing more closed or carefully guarded or kept secret than Google's algorithms for search, and nobody uh, else on the outside can get access to them and alter them in some particular way so as to, for example, optimize for uh, uh, searching the works of uh, you, Nick, or, or my works, you know, on, on the Internet. Right. Uh -huh. Now, should government get involved in opening bottlenecks? And the answer is sometimes. When those bottlenecks represent monopoly power that is going to be used to thwart innovation or crush competition, that's when government should get involved. I see. So I'd like to move the, uh, the, the, the conversation a little bit towards uh, sort of more recent events and, and privacy and uh, matters of uh, security. So, you know, as far back as 1994, um, U.S. Congress passed the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA, uh, which was quite controversial at the time. But it, it was originally put there to aid law enforcement in its efforts to conduct surveillance of digital telephone networks. Um, what, what was that about, and, and how did that affect and lay the ground for, groundwork for where we are today? Okay, so, uh, you know, just to go back in history, uh, in that time period, approximately 20 years ago, a voice communication was over these landline networks for the most part, not over cellular, and certainly not over anything like the Internet. It was over these circuit switch networks. And since almost all voice communication was on those networks, that meant that the actual communications themselves would be consolidated within the networks of just a few companies. And they were all regulated by the FCC. They're still regulated by the FCC. Mm -hmm. So in that time period 20 years ago, it was physically possible to have the government, either through the FCC or through some other arm of government, go to just a handful of companies and say, you're going to see all, all, all the phone calls in America, and most phone calls in the world are physically going to tr go through the United States. Right. Uh -huh. Even if they're going from China to Europe, they're probably going to go through the United States. So you're going to see almost all phone calls in the world, and under certain conditions, we want to eavesdrop on those phone calls. So it was very, it was, it was physically easy, and from a regulatory perspective, uh, it wasn't very intrusive. The only question in that time period, there were two questions. Question one would be, would the government have to get a warrant from a court to get access to those calls? And question two would be, well, who would pay 
for the eavesdropping because it was actually a fairly complex technical matter to do that. Right. And the I FBI wanted the FCC to order the phone companies to pay, I and I told the FBI, I'm not doing that. You can figure out how to get the phone companies to pay. I have no idea how you'll do that. But if you can't do that, go to Congress and get an appropriation and you spend the money. So it, it may seem a little antiquated, but the primary debate was about who would get the money to do it. I see. So moving the, moving the clock forward to today, um, when, a, uh, when an Internet service provider or even an equipment vendor such as you know, a Cisco Juniper, Alcatel Lucent or Huawei is building um, uh, equipment for use by an operator, Who's, whose responsibility is it to create the technical ability and, and who pays for the ability to, to tap Internet communications? Okay, well, first of all, as far as the who pays part is concerned, it, the debate hasn't changed one bit from where it was 20 years ago, right? So the idea of the different agencies and government is, well, we don't have any money, so you companies ought to do all the work of assembling the data and when you've got it all organized and when you figured out the database and when you've used Hadoop to get all the unstructured data in some kind of searchable form, we'll just show up and we'll just borrow it. We'll just have access to it. Right? So that's actually what all the newspaper accounts have said that the American agencies have been doing. Mm -hmm. They've been letting the companies do all the work of gathering the data and organizing it and storing it and of course, the companies apparently want to do that for their commercial purposes, and the government is saying, how about a free ride? You know, we have some national security purposes as well. But, but if the I thing might, that has changed, it, yeah, uh -huh. the, the thing that has changed is the government is not interested in so much anymore in just the voice communications, which now are predominantly mobile. It's interested in all this other data that the over-the-top companies have learned how to gather which is where am I and what am I saying on Twitter and what am I saying in emails and what have I saved, what pictures have I taken uh, and where have I saved those pictures and in other words, what am I doing, what am I thinking and most importantly, what predictions can be made about what I'm about to do. All of that, which commercial companies have perfected so that they can tell advertisers where to advertise, the government is saying, if you can make those kinds of predictions, then that means you can help us make predictions about who is, who is about to commit crimes, some of them potentially really hideous. All right, so some of the, uh, so clearly the, the, the over-the-top companies uh, are already collecting large amounts of data just for the service that they provide. And so they're, they're a ripe source for that uh, information from law enforcement and intelligence agencies. But the, the network equipment, the switches and routers that make up the Internet, they too can be, you know, we can eavesdrop into them. Um, you know, there's eavesdropping capabilities that have to be put in anyway just to maintain and have them work. Um, but uh, are, they, are the builders of, of the equipment, are they responsible for, are they required in any way to provide the means uh, to, you know, the, the back door to be able to listen to, to communications? Well, uh, if you're asking whether there's a law or a regulation that affects the design of routers or servers or, for that matter, data centers, so as to permit back doors, no is the answer to that question, at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, is that the regime in China? Well, that's the matter of a tremendous amount of debate, and the Chinese would say no, and a lot of other people would say the true answer in China is yes. So you have to ask that country on, a question on a country-by-country -country uh, basis. I see. But it's not, if I may say so, it's not really, I think, the most important question, because the, the, the big fact is that approximately four firms that are headquartered in the United States gather the overwhelming amount of over-the-top information. And they are storing it and organizing it for their own commercial purposes. And it's all there for the government to tap into. And according to newspaper accounts, mm -hmm. we don't, I don't have any, anything to go by but that, uh, the National Security Agency has 
persuaded those companies to give access to the data or according to a story uh, two days ago they didn't even ask they just went ahead and and got access to the data right yes yeah, yeah. I mean with you, with hindsight do you think that uh, the government should have played more of a more of a positive role earlier on to either uh, in, uh, introduce regulation um, the for the over-the-top industries to prevent that either that consolidation into just four companies or put in place uh, more guidelines on how that data was stored and how much was stored and for what period well um, I would give no as my answer to both those questions and I would just want to point out for 20 straight years the uh, tech industry in the United States and uh, in most other countries but especially in the United States has vigorously stood for the proposition that uh, the government should really not ever tell it what to do on any topic whatsoever. Right. <laughs> uh, and the idea that the industry would have said, oh, we could use some regulation about design, uh, and it's really good mm -hmm. if the government tells us when it might want to have access to the information, that would have produced a uh, a firestorm of opposition and hostility and you have to ask really what would have been what would have been the point uh, you know would, would would anything be different if the government had over the past 20 years regulated something about the design of the internet I don't mm -hmm. think anything would have, uh, have been different you'd still be facing the exact same questions we're now facing which 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 really boiled down to just one question so if, for example, Google is going to gather all this data, mm -hmm. then why shouldn't a national security agency be able to make a prediction about a potential bad actor's bad acts that's just as accurate as a prediction Google might make about what advertisers will appeal to that person? Right. So what, one area where the government seems to have got involved, um, there is uh, it's it, it's alleged that the, the the National Security Agency had influenced the data encryption standards to make them weaker and easier for government to crack, um, and uh, as a consequence, uh, what, what do you think the the consequences should will be on the degree to which we trust our networks and the internet in general for our secure communications, and uh, you know what does it mean for the future of banking and e-commerce and uh, you know do you think this will have a long-term detrimental effect I think that uh, the tech industry has not um, been able to design uh, and implement uh, security at any level of the network uh, in a way that's been satisfactory to anybody so yeah, I, would agree. I would agree wholeheartedly with that <laughs> yeah right um, Probably uh, it would be worth looking at the um, eBay slash PayPal paper that was just published yesterday, uh, which lays out a vision of the way a online monetary system or on an online payment system actually uh, could work, and and you could be you and your students could be the judge of whether they've uh, got a better idea about security. But I would say this is a problem that remains to be solved. And unless it is solved in a public-private consensual matter, then I think the future of the Internet is going to be uh, 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 less than it should be. And what, what do you think, you know, when we're making this interview, it's just a few days after the, uh, uh, the breaking news about the alleged U.S. spying on Chancellor Merkel of Germany. What, what do you think... The international impact is going to be of these uh, of these revelations. Well, um, when I first went to China in uh, the late 1990s as a member of the U.S. government, uh, I was advised that it would probably be the case that uh, my hotel room would be entered when I left it, and that people in the Chinese government would examine everything they could find there. Uh, and if I left the computer, they would um, get into the computer and see what they could get out of it. I would just like to say that they left the room very neatly arranged, but not in the same way that I had left it. 
And let me uh, go on to say that there's nothing new under the sun, and uh, as long as there have been people in power, those people in power have wondered what other people in power were doing and have tried to find that out. Clearly, the allegations related to, you know, the, the, the recent allegations of uh, listening into a foreign, foreign ally and uh, in Germany with the, you know, the ghost of, of East Germany uh, looming large, you know, has particular implications. Um, and uh, do you think this will, uh, this will die down over the next few days or weeks, or do you think it'll uh, actually change the way that we see privacy and the, the way in which different countries spy on each other? You know, a lot of people uh, think that the debate here is between privacy and security. That if you want to have security uh, uh, for everybody, you need to interfere or impinge on other people's privacy. My own view, which is shaped by uh, reading a great book by uh, the late uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a book called Secrecy, which was published in 1998, my own view is that the real issue is openness and closeness, uh, public and secret, and that uh, almost everything the government does today which is secret really ought to be public. Not everything, but almost everything. And I don't mean public in the sense of there ought to be constant Twitter feeds of everything the government is finding out, but I do mean that governments everywhere ought to be more open about what they are doing. And if that were the case, then I believe that it would be substantially easier for communities, the citizens of the United States, for example, to form a consensus about the appropriate limits of security and the appropriate uh, uh, rights of privacy. But the real, the real enemy of freedom is secrecy. Yeah, and I think that that's uh, that's become very clear in the last few months. As you know, s suddenly we become aware of many things which we may have suspected were going on, but uh, they're thrust forward into the public debate. Debate, and if nothing else, for sure, the quality of that debate has improved tremendously in the last few months because of the scrutiny that it's come under and it's realizing how what a lack of transparency there has been in the past so I would uh, I would agree very much with that with that sentiment so if if you were in you know if you were magically put in the position to be able to uh, sort of take charge um, I'm not quite sure of what or of whom um, what would what would be your desire for how we would get to that place of greater openness and transparency um, I think you have to do a, a, a number of different things. Uh, so, for example, uh, in the United States, according to uh, reporters who have gotten access to some of these documents, there are well more than a million people who have a, a security classification. Well, if it's more than a million people who have it, it's not worth very much. Uh, really, there should be almost uh, no one <laughs> who has access to the kinds of uh, conclusions that the computers run by the National Security Agency are uh, able to draw about bad actors. Second, those people should have terms of duty of not more than five years so that we don't empower uh, uh, by the power of secrets certain individuals who have immense sway over government and other and, and people in the private sector. Uh, third, the nature of the information gathered by government ought to be open. Not the details, but the generic categories. They all ought to be known so that everyone understands what the government is doing. Again, not day by day or case by case, but in, in the abstract. Uh, and then fourth, uh, any individual who the government has targeted is going to need to be able to get access if they're charged with a crime or they're prosecuted, they're going to be able to, they're going to need to get access to the information the government used to target them. Otherwise, you're having trial by computer and you're having trial by algorithm. Right. Now, that concept assumes that you're innocent until proven guilty, but it also goes a little further and says the issue of proof of guilt can't totally be left to the computers and the government 
it has to be that the defendant, the accused, also has access to that same information and that same uh, data bank if the charges are brought. That balance doesn't right now exist in American law. Mm -hmm. are, are, you, are you confident, optimistic that uh, the, the, the current debate will help move us in that direction? Or, uh, or, or yes, I am. Yes, I am. I think it's been, I think that the uh, news stories have been immensely helpful. Um, I uh, take with a grain of salt some of the protestations uh, of foreign leaders uh, who are shocked and shocked and shocked to find out that there's spying uh, that's been going on. Uh -huh. I guess for the first time in history, there this has been going on, is their view. Uh -huh. But I think that the uh, overall, uh, uh, the revelations are leading to uh, an open debate about that which ought to be open. With that, I thank you very much, um, and want particularly thank you for uh, keeping this debate alive and for your for your participation in it. It certainly helped raise the quality of the debate and discussion over the last few months. So it's a thank you, Nick. pleasure and honor to talk with you about it, Reed. Thank, thank you. you, Nick. Good to be with you and all of your all of your clients.